And then Rose, which is like my, my go-to, I love Rose all day. It's just, um, it's like a, a smile for your eyeballs. It just makes you happy. There's something to that rose colored glasses. <laughs> well, so that's, it, there really is. And that's, you know, part of the research and all this, I, I found that the term see the world through rose colored glasses is derived from. Welcome to obsessed show a podcast that is designed to inspire featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh miles. Hey there, sunshine. Today's episode is brought to you by The Perfect Match, a game where designers submit mood boards created with Adobe stock assets and earn the chance to play on a fab game show to win big. As designers, we pitch good vibes and great ideas through visuals all day, every day. But how well does our design communicate? Do clients and higher-ups really understand the work we put in front of them? Well, let's find out. Test your mad skills by assembling a brand-inspired mood board with Adobe stock images to the perfect match. And if your skillful project is chosen, you'll be featured on Adobe's monthly live streaming game show with other groovy designers, art directors, and creatives, where the winner goes home with $750. It's free to participate in the perfect match. Submit an entry, and Adobe will buy you coffee for your time. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, we're continuing an unexpected trend of interviewing another lead singer. Today I'm chatting with AJ Jackson, songwriter, director, and perhaps best known as the lead singer of the international platinum selling rock band, Saint Motel. They've played Coachella and toured with Imagine Dragons, but imagine my surprise when I found out that their song, Just My Type, has nothing to do with typography. AJ is also the founder of AVU, a new sunglasses brand we're going to talk to him today about the role that color theory plays in his product line. I'm excited to explore the thread of his journey from film to songwriting and launching a product. So without further ado, here's my conversation with AJ Jackson. Okay, kids, all the way from Tulum, please welcome AJ Jackson. AJ, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hello, thank you for having me. Good to be here. So... I'm not sure what to make of all of this as we talked a little bit over the top of the show, but <laughs> last episode we interviewed the lead singer of They Might Be Giants, which was really cool. And so having you uh, reach out was also pretty interesting. Um, so that makes two two lead singers in a row. So thanks for helping us make this little little trend a thing. <laughs> My pleasure. I'm happy to be following uh, John from They Might Be Giants, a huge, huge fan of that band. Yeah, uh, really cool. And it was also like... Um, such a down to earth guy. So just cool to, to, to meet folks like that and find out like, yeah. oh, they're just normal people. Right. They, they, they seem like they had that kind of vibe. I and never it, met them, but one of the designers that we, uh, interviewed a few years ago, who I put in the category of famous designers, uh, Paula Scher famously said like famous graphic designers are kind of like famous dentists. Like if you don't, <laughs> if you don't have any reason <laughs> to know who they are, like nobody really really cares. And it's, it's always fun to meet other celebrity types and find out like, oh, they're just, they're just people. Yeah. They're just people. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm excited to, um, talk to you more about a view and, uh, and origin stories, but I'm especially interested with your background as lead singer of St. Motel. Um, you know, you also had a particularly, uh, interesting commercial success as a, as a director, I understand. So I know there's, there's more to this than just the sunglasses and the music. And, uh, it, even as I was looking back at some of the the videos and films that I, I believe were ones that you directed for St. Motel, there's like a little bit of a retro, like groovy vibe. There's some James Bond stuff going in. So I'm really curious to hear kind of your background and, and fill us in a little bit on, um, on your origin story. Sure, sure. I, my origin story, I, I believe, can be summarized in I, I just love to create and I gravitate mostly to the quickest form of creation for me, which is music. But I didn't study music. I studied film at film schools where the band started. 
And that's what I did to make a living before music would pay the bills. And um, that's kind of how I got more into directing and editing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when music kind of became the main uh, commitment, it tapered off slightly, but still doing the occasional music video here and there. So where did the name Saint Motel come from? We, uh, we were kind of an unnamed band at the time. We, in college, had another band that had a name I, I won't even bring up uh, because it needed to be replaced. It was that bad. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we, we had just a ton of names. And one, we had Kid Modell. And I think uh, on my desk at the time, I had a bunch of kind of old vintage postcards. And uh, one of them has the, the saint or something like that. And I was with the guitarist in the band and kind of took that, that one name, combined it with Saints. And it felt, uh, it felt like a good combination of dark and light and kind of, you know, the saintly and the seediness of a motel it, it represent kind of the, the dichotomy we wanted to portray with the, um, with the music where we have kind of more upbeat music with some more kind of tongue in cheek lyrics, something to kind of counterbalance it. Um, the name felt like a good, uh, a good balance. And then, Hey, we had the dot com was available. So that was a perk too. <laughs> <laughs> Always a bonus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I've joked a lot that I'm, uh, but I'm serious when I say this, I'm, I'm the type of creative person who likes to do all the things. So like host podcasts and do speaking and write and experiment with photography and video and, um, and it seems like there's a little bit of that with you as well. And I'm, I'm curious, like, especially in your role as front man of this band, like you're writing the songs and you're singing, you're performing, you're also directing some of the videos. Like, how do you decide which creative things to let go and which things that you're most interested in hanging on to? Well, initially when we were just a DIY band, it was kind of necessary for survival to create everything. Um, and then, you know, slowly as we, we started having more people on the team and a record label and management, and, you know, we could outsource things. Um, it mostly became, you know, friends of mine from film school, people I knew pretty well. Uh, a music video is such a tricky, tricky art form. Um, you know, it, it's, pretty hit or miss. I feel like <laughs> with music videos, <laughs> um, you know, and it, it's kind of, it's kind of tough to say what you're going to get. Um, so that one's a little, little harder to let go. And if, if it happens, it's, it's to close friends usually, um, or someone that has just a body work that's really cool. Um, because, you know, one thing that happened recently with our music video for it's all happening was, uh, the, the, you know, a lot of the reasons why I'm still making the music videos is because music video budgets keep going down and, uh, you know, I, I can be resourceful, um, as someone in the band who, you know, it matters very much. It turns out, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice a lot more and, and you know, obviously work for free and try to, uh, to pull any favors I can at the time. But, um, yeah, I think as much as possible, letting go is, is what I'm trying, <laughs> especially with now having an eyewear brand. It's just, uh, I think it's, it's out of experience. I think now that you kind of, you might agree with the way that you're kind of have your hands in all facets of this podcast and the creative that when you find someone that comes along that you either just connect with, or you think they do a great job of that particular thing. It's, it's a joy to kind of, start collaborating with that person. And that's, uh, that's kind of the journey I'm on now. Yeah. Super cool. I know when I was, um, running my previous company at the kind of the height, we had 20 some people that worked there. So I never a huge agency, but, you know, starting from one and to be able to scale, uh, some of those other pieces and to get out to like, okay, well, I don't need to touch this part of the business anymore. I don't need to do this activity anymore. And to bring on those trusted folks, I think was always, was always a really good day. <laughs> yes. Um, but absolutely. you talked about, um, you know, kind of with the launch of the brand, I'm, I'm curious what, what led to this, like, 
how did you decide um, eyewear or sunglasses in particular? Like, is this something that you had in mind for a long time or something that was recently inspired? I've always been a big uh, proponent of eyewear and I love kind of experimenting with different colors. And it, it, it was, it, it really was rooted in, I didn't like carrying around prescription glasses and prescription sunglasses. So I would wear clip-ons. And once I started wearing clip-ons, you know, occasionally I'd be in some vintage shop somewhere and I'd find clip-ons that fit my frames that were like a different color. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like I never really, you know, explored more than just like black, brown or green lenses. Um, and then, you know, when I might misplace or lose those clip-ons, um, I couldn't find that color again. So I was really just looking to find a, an option to explore different colored lenses. And I couldn't really find something that existed. So I was kind of kicking around this idea for a while with some, some friends of mine back in Minnesota that work at 3M. And um, I think really the catalyst behind it was the pandemic because when our tour kind of wrapped up, uh, it was a great outlet for me to keep my mind active and not go completely insane. Uh, and during that time it was really where it became an actual thing. You know, I was, uh, just 3d printing versions of it in my local library. I would just go down there all the time that, you know, they knew me as that weird guy with the glasses that would just come and <laughs> fine tune stuff. And, um, yeah, it just became, became a kind of a passion. And just, if anything, it was a really fun kind of exploratory process to see what it was like. Cause it's, it, there's a lot of similarities with creative aspects of, of other things I dabble in, but it's a very new experience in a lot of regards, uh, for me. So it's been, a it's been an interesting journey. Well, I'm sure on the positive front with COVID, you know, the time to, that you weren't going to be on stage or on touring, um, on tour that you would have more time to think about this and work on it. But how has that impacted like production cycles as far as, you know, manufacturing and other things outside of just you doing the work? Yeah. You know, so far, I mean, probably because a very, very small company and, you know, uh, the products also very small. <laughs> we, we haven't had any substantial issues in that regard. You know, we've had a couple of delays, but nothing like what I'm seeing, you know, other people that have massive, uh, crates and, and shipments coming in. Um, so we've been kind of lucky in that regard. I haven't felt any of the brunt of it. The only thing, you know, is like the library has been closed. Haven't been able to 3d print as much, uh, but that's all opening up again. Um, so in that regard, it's been okay. It's been okay. And also finding, you know, finding time to collaborate with people and, uh, and work remotely with people as far as, you know, other aspects of the business too, or if it's fulfillment or marketing or, uh, any, any kind of, you know, uh, aspects that, that you kind of need just the remote possibilities are, I'm not, I guess I wasn't doing this before the pandemic, but I like to think enhanced from it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one thing I want to make sure that our audience understands because we just kind of like jumped into the production and all of that stuff. Like, tell us a little bit more about the product. Like what, what problem sure. were you trying to solve? I know you talked about the different colors, but you know, what, what innovation did you decide to bring to the market or did you think was missing from sunglasses? Okay. That's a great question. So to really put in perspective, the, the darkest chapter of my eyewear experience, I bought three frames of the same glasses because I wanted one in rose, one in blue, and then one just non-colored or, you know, just normal, clear optical lenses. And I walked out of that, looking at the price tag, just like, this is insane. Like, why? Why did I just pay so much? It's the same mm -hmm. frame. It's the same prescription. So I... I wanted to create something. Well, actually, I didn't want to create something. I just wanted to find something that would allow me to change out <laughs> if different colors. If you could have colors, just bought it, that would have saved you I a would lot have, of time. <laughs> oh, my God. I would have gladly just bought it. I, I really um, was not planning on, on launching an eyewear business. I just wanted glasses, prescription glasses. I could change out the color. So what we ended up designing was uh, this frame that I'm wearing now. So you can slide in different colored lenses in front of your prescription lenses and slide them out. And it's designed so you know, there's the, 
the kind of the hook on the side where you put your fingers to grab it so you never get fingerprints on it. And that's also what you push up on the side to pull it out. And then, you know, they ship with these little leather lens wallets. So when you take them out, you put them in the little lens wallet and that also you slide in and out from the handle. So you never have to get fingerprints on it. Um, you know, right now <clears throat> I'm on vacation and I have, I think, four different colors with me. You know, I'm, I'm not in that situation where I was, where I have my one pair of prescription sunglasses and I was stuck with, you know, if it's green or brown or black, whatever color it is. I can change out the color based on what I need. If it's a rainy day, you know, if I, if I need a lot of sun, you know, protection, you know, what it happens, whatever it happens to be. So it's kind of nice to have that freedom. And that's the origin story of AVU, um, interchangeable sunglasses. And I know, um, because I've looked at the website <laughs> in preparation for our <laughs> interview today, but I know color theory is a big part of, of the brand as well. So maybe yeah. talk us through, um, why you chose some of the colors that you did and kind of how that plays into the product. Well, funny enough, color theory was the name of the company before this, uh, clothing company called theory sent me so many cease and desist letters. <laughs> I decided it's just not worth it. Yeah. Uh, but color theory, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's really the, the origin story of this and, and, you know, uh, Isaac Newton and just kind of the benefits and the joys and, um, the way that different colors can affect your mood and your productivity. Um, it's, it's a fun thing to explore and to see how it works for you. Uh, we have six colors right now. Um, looking at, at having a couple more pretty soon, but right now we have uh, black, green, brown, yellow, rose, and blue. So a little bit about those options. Um, you know, blue has an activating effect, like the same reason why blue light it, in the evening, you usually have more red, yellow light to cancel out that blue light. Blue light's great and it gets your biological rhythm going in the morning. You know, it's, it's the opposite of winding down. So blue is a good way to start your day moving into like a, a green or a black midday when it gets really bright out, um, you know, then switch to like a brown. Uh, our brown is very kind of like dreamlike, nostalgic. And then yellow is to me kind of like caffeine for your eyeballs. You slip in the, the yellow when you want to focus, when you want a surge of energy. Um, you know, it's, it's great for blue light blocking, obviously, and and driving and at night and stuff like that. You see it at gas stations, but it really has a very immediate impact <laughs> on your state of mind. And then rose, which is like my, my go-to, I love rose all day. It's just, um, it's like a, a smile for your eyeballs. It just makes you happy. There's something to that rose colored glasses. <laughs> well, so that's, it, there really is. And that's, you know, part of the research and all this, I, I found that the term see the world through rose colored glasses is derived from civil war doctors would prescribe rose colored crystals or glass for uh, soldiers to look through to deal with PTSD because they felt it made it, you know, made it a little bit better. Mm, that's so interesting. All the way back in the civil war times. Yeah. Yeah. Even like, I guess, uh, Roman Emperor Nero would watch gladiator fights looking through, I believe it was purple colored glass or maybe it might have been green. Actually, I can't remember because green is good for color contrast, but yeah, it's, it's a long, long history of, of colors and, and, and enhancing human experience. That's pretty wild. How, how often do you find yourself swapping out the lenses? Is this like an hour by hour thing or like you go a no. stretch with a couple well, weeks of go and rose? That's a great question. I, it depends on what I'm doing. So like if I'm just a normal day, you know, in, in the studio, whatever, I'm probably just using two colors, you know, one, I'm going outside, probably slip in like a black, brown or green. And then if I'm in the studio, I'll probably leave in like a rose or a yellow. But if I'm on like on a road trip or something where my surroundings are constantly changing, uh, I like to have all six because, you know, it, it's, it's a constant, um, uh, way to participate with your surroundings. You know, like we were just driving from California to Texas and uh, I forgot my AVUs and I had one pair of prescription lenses and it was just green lenses the entire drive. And the whole time I was just thinking, now I know what I'm missing and 
I'm, it, it kind of sucks when you're limited to that. You know, it's uh, once you experience the ability to, to modify your color and change your color on a whim, um, that, at least the goal is that you'll never want to buy one color sunglasses again. Because it's like, why? Why pay this money? You're only going to have that like brown or blue lens. Like, that's it. You know, you're stuck with that. And especially if it's prescription, that's even another cost on top of that. Um, you know, ideally someday in the future, we'd be able to have a, you know, print your lens on demand and you could choose from the millions of colors, your specific color, you know, like your Josh color, you want this specific hue of indigo or, uh, you know, this kind of whatever it is. And then you print that right there, but we're a long ways away from that. (laughs) Right. And beyond colors too, actually, I should mention patterns. You know, we are looking at maybe slipping in some kind of spectrum style glasses to Mm. make the light look kind of fun when you want to have an interesting night out, Um, you know, slip in some patterns that are like printed on the lens that look like eyeballs. So like maybe, you know, you can have dragon eyes or you could have hearts or, you know, whatever it is. So basically the frame, you can slip anything you want in there. Yeah. I mean, for, for cameras and for lenses for a long time, we've had polarized of course. Um, exactly. Or like in, in some film, they use the like pro mist or mist filters to make it kind of more dreamy looking. Yeah. This is, that could starlight. be interesting too. Oh yeah. Starlight. Absolutely. That'd be cool too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's very similar to a camera actually. The like, same way you slide in like an ND filter on like a, a high end camera. It's, it's the same kind of you're slipping in, in front of your lens, a filter to how you see the world. Yeah. And, And of course, like you mentioned kind of early in the show, like there are plenty of prescription glasses where you can put clip on things, but like yours actually slides into the body. So it's not like this, this external thing. And, you know, I've, I've never been a real fan of the, what's it called when they kind of automatically tint transitions, like the, when you're in kind of a bright room inside and it looks like you're wearing dark sunglasses, like that is just a weird thing for me. So I love the idea that you can just very intentionally pop them in or out. Absolutely. Yeah. Transitions, you know, it, it's a, a great concept. It's just, it's not a hundred percent. Like, uh, I remember my dad growing up had transition lenses and sometimes it'd be like different lenses would be different colors or different shades, I should say. And it, you know, it was never perfect. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different than that. Well, transitioning <laughs> a little bit, um, tell <laughs> yeah. us a little bit about the team that's working on a view. And I'm, I'm also curious if there's any overlap, uh, with the band, like, are there, you know, common elements there or is this a totally separate thing? Well, you know, the band, we have been talking about doing a, uh, a St. Motel pack because our album was uh, red, blue, and green. And we have those lenses at a view. So we're, we're going to do a St. Motel a view pack of, uh, you know, a special edition kind of package with those lenses. Um, so there's overlap there, you know, all the guys have them and, and rock them. Uh, but the team, the team is very small, you know, everything's pretty much, um, you know, freelance. A lot of the, you know, the online creative direction is done by my fiance, Tiffany. She's got a, a very good sense of all that stuff. And you know, some friends are helping out with, um, marketing and, fulfillment is like a, a local company. And so it's, it's all very small, you know, like it, it's a very bare bones thing. You know, it's just a couple of us dealing with customers and making sure everyone's happy and just really trying to give the best experience possible and really trying to, you know, be as hands-on as possible to make sure it is as good as it can be. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so obviously you're kind of on a, on a getaway now, and I appreciate the fact that we're doing this interview even while you're out of the country, but, um, My pleasure. I, and I'm sure, you know, there's, there's probably the answer of, I don't have a typical day. Things are different all the time, but I'm curious when you're, when you're in a view mode, um, what, what does a day normally look like for you or what are the, what are the types of things that you're thinking on and working on kind of during the week? Yeah. Um, with the a view day, I suppose it's kind of, you know, I feel like most, uh, most logical part of my brain is functioning early kind of mid morning. I think that's a view time of day <laughs> and I'm probably going to go to music mode afternoon. Um, but just making sure, you know, everything, all the orders have been fulfilled, you know, everyone's questions are being answered. Um, you know, that's always priority making sure, you know, we're, 
we're always kind of looking around what's next. Like we're kind of in the process of designing square frames, uh, hopefully by early next year, uh, making sure everything's you know functioning and you know it's it's been it's a new product like it doesn't exist. So always making sure that the website really conveys the the messaging behind it or the novel aspects of it without being like too much uh, complication. Cause it's really simple when you have them, but when you kind of explain it, I have a tendency to maybe uh, over explain it. So trying to like, you know, always fine tune that. Um, but yeah, just, just, just checking across the board, make sure everything is being, being handled. So on, and, on the music yeah. days or nights as maybe it were, um, yeah. what, what is a songwriting process look like for you? You know, how often are you working on new materials or, you know, anything you care to share about how that works? Sure. Uh, you know, that is the great joy in my life. And that is, you know, especially now is an interesting phase as we just put out the last album. That's kind of getting back into the new music phase. I'm always kind of writing music, but now that it's time to make a new album, I'm trying to think of kind of creative ways to do it. Uh, the last album, the original motion picture soundtrack, I kind of created um, arbitrary guidelines to it. So I, I rented a, a cabin in the mountains and I had a certain period of time I was going to go there. And then I would, you know, from this time to this time, I'd make music, then I'd take a break and I'd meditate and then I'd make music and I'd take a break and I'd eat some food and I'd take a break and I'd go for a hike. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'd leave it behind and I wouldn't think about it again, or I'd try not to think about it. Again. You know, I'd probably I would listen to it in the car ride back what I did that day or something. And then the idea is then approach the next day with a fresh start. Um, and I was doing that because before that, uh, same with television was written mostly on the road and, uh, you know, cause my type EP happened and we started touring and then it was just need to finish the album. So it was kind of like, there was no structure to it. It was just constant. It was always in that mode. And I, and I liked the idea of having it at arm's length. So, um, it could feel more precious. So this, this go around, um, you know, I bring music recording, uh, equipment usually wherever I go. So for instance, you know, I'm here in Mexico right now, um, I'm liking the idea of the mobile studio, at least for the initial concepts, um, just as an experiment right now, it's tough with, with the state of the world, um, but doing it, you know, responsibly. And, uh, I think that might be a parameter I'm going to explore a bit for writing, especially since our tour was just canceled because of, uh, you know, COVID precautions. So that, that is one element of it. But when they actually get to the writing, that <clears throat> is always just the great mystery. And that, that's what's so exciting about it. And I'm sure you know, most people listening to this that are creative and, and designers, it's um, the excitement of not knowing where it's coming from, you know, and to me, writing a song is like solving a mystery. So mm, <clears throat> you know, like that. why are you going this direction? What, is the answer you know something's pulling you you know when it's not right you know like there's, there's all these strange things about it uh so that that's always the most fun part and then the most grueling but most rewarding in the end is the lyrics um when you have to be somewhat more analytical <laughs> Does, are you suggesting that like the lyrics are kind of the last part of what you do with songwriting? Like you're doing the, you, the melody usually. and the tune kind of first and then building the lyrics yeah, on yeah. top of it? That's traditionally the way it is. I'll, I'll sing gibberish a lot of times. And then um, from there, maybe I'll pull a couple words that seem to be an interesting idea that I'll base the song around. But yeah, lyrics usually come towards the end uh, with a few exceptions. Very interesting. Yeah. I've loved, um, uh, I've listened to another podcast called song exploder for a long time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it's a, it's one of those where they like play everything from here's what I recorded on my iPhone and what I was thinking and my voice memo and, you know, it kind of breaks apart all the pieces and, um, you know, it's just, I think it's really interesting as 
you know, I'm, I'm not a recording artist. I've <laughs> played guitar a little bit off and on through my life, but never been like, never considered myself a super strong musician, but it's just cool to see kind of like the parallel path of other creatives of how they kind of think through things. And it kind of helps me think about maybe design differently to hear like, Oh, we start with this versus that or kind of how the process yeah, works. Uh, and I'd imagine there's so many parallels too with, you know, when you're tweaking something and then you're like, ah, I'm going to approach it a different way or you keep tweaking it until it feels right, but not to a point where you're over doing it. And at some point you have to figure out when to let it go, knowing that probably it can always be better in some way, but mm, you know, right. there's similarities at, for sure. I, I, um, in both. Well, AJ, I'm curious, this is maybe reaching a little bit, but what do you feel like is one of your proudest professional moments? Um, well, it was very cool that Wired Magazine, who, yeah, that's like probably the only magazine I think I've subscribed to since I was a kid, <laughs> uh, covered the glasses as one of the, their, their coolest glasses of the summer. And I was like, that is, that is a, an honor. Oh, super honor. cool. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, that was pretty special. Um, are there any, uh, you know, I normally ask our design guests if they have any design heroes. And so maybe you have design heroes, but also, uh, could lump in other, you know, musicians or favorite acts, any, anybody that you've looked up to kind of either in the fashion design business or, or in music. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of artists that I see that have a very strong sense of design in, in their aesthetic. Um, I remember uh, writing a paper about the white stripes in college about how they're, it was actually for American folk history and the teacher did not like that, but just, uh, <laughs> you know, su such a well thought out sense of design that accompanied the music so perfectly. Um, they're, they're a very, very strong example, um, of doing it like perfectly. So sometimes, you know, you can have the most well thought out designed concepts and, and videos and artwork, but it's just, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to match the music or it's going to like enhance the music, you know? So when, when the two meet well, you know, cause it's sometimes such a letdown when you love this band or this album, but the album cover looks so weird or like not mm -hmm. what you were hoping or uh, when the two things meet, it's, it's like the ultimate, joy you know when you're like oh my god everything they're doing it's like across the board creative is just it's in sync and it, it makes sense and it's taking it to another level like that that is always cool to see i have to imagine that sentiment is resonating with a lot of our uh especially the visual design uh professionals who listen to this show um i i know like growing up in the 90s buying you know grunge band albums and stuff like the, the act of opening the CD and pulling out the jacket and seeing what was printed and how they treated the lyrics. And like, for me as a design student, like that was a super cool element to that process that sadly, you know, I don't get a lot of that because I don't buy a lot of physical <laughs> music anymore. So there's, yeah, there's yeah. so much of that that's missing now, but, um, unless you're, you know, buying vinyl or still buying CDs or whatever, but, um, there's just a big part of that experience that's kind of missing in the digital world. You know, it just made me kind of think of when you're mentioning like that. So, you know, prior to social media, when you really fell in love with some music, you wanted to kind of know everything about that artist. And then their uh, design was another conscious choice of them. So then you kind of maybe got to know them a little bit more through the packaging and it, you, you, you further that kind of connection. And now maybe people don't have that as much, the physical, um, even though we know vinyl is still doing great, but it's almost a pre-social media way to connect with your favorite artists in another way. You know, even if they're not designing themselves, you know, they're, they're working with somebody that they respect that's you know, achieving the vision they want to achieve. So it's another way to kind of see inside their brain. I mean, back then for the, bands that included it it was like one of the few ways to find lyrics 
So like, yeah, what are they, what are they saying? What's that one line? Or right. are you trying to learn all the words to your favorite song? <laughs> As I'm choking and dying here, trying to learn all yeah. the words to your favorite song. And you're like, what? I, I want to, I want to figure that out. Like what, what are they saying? And like, it was so hard to find that in other places, you know, really dating ourselves here, but pre-internet. <laughs> That's absolutely, absolutely true. I remember singing the wrong lyrics for the longest time. I think, uh, you know, liner notes is something that we take very seriously for no reason other than um, it's kind of a long running thing in the band to try to make, uh, you know, <laughs> the best liner notes. Uh, you know, it's like um, the, the liner notes for the original motion picture soundtrack are like a, a screenplay. Uh, for Samo Television, it was like yeah. a, a very long kind of almost instruction manual for it a TV, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, everything that goes in there is just, uh, another way to do something fun. And St. Mo television, you did like kind of this AR VR kind of element with it too. Right. What, what, uh, or tell us a little bit about that. So that, that really started when a, a friend of mine who went to film school with me and is an amazing director, um, he's done a few of our videos he got really into VR very early on. It's like 2015, early 2016 and got me really excited about it. And I was like, Oh my God. Yes. Okay. We're going to do the whole album with this concept where you're inside of the TV and you're looking out through this giant window with the giants that are on the couch watching you as you perform. And it's almost like live theater when they change the channel. It's like, Oh, quick, get these people out. You know, whatever. It was going to be this really fun kind of interactive thing. And there'd be a story out in the living room too. Like you'd see the giants, the parents would leave that, daughter would have her boyfriend come over or something or like there'd be like an earthquake out there or the dog would come in and watch a show and that was the original concept and it just was way out of our price range and when it came you know after about two months of developing it we're like well, holy crap you know i mean the technology has come a long way since then but then it we uh just decided to try one and then once we did one we slowly kind of uh did then we did two and then we did three and then before you know it, we had the entire album we had a vr component for it so then we wrapped it all into this vr app you can actually go inside and sit in the album cover and dip your feet in the pool the album cover has a pool that you're like diving into a pool and uh you can do your virtual experiences based around that so yeah it kind of started with one concept and then grew into something else yeah that's super cool i, I looked a little bit at the um, examples from, from the app. And is that still available? Is it still downloadable? I believe, you know, I think it is still free download in the app store and, and the Google play store. We haven't maybe updated it in like a year or two. So I'm not sure if it works like the iPhone 12 or 13 now, but, um, if it doesn't send us an email, we probably should get that <laughs> updated. It's pretty fun. Cool. Well, listeners check that out. We'll see if, uh, see if it's still working. Um, yeah. So one of the questions that I ask everybody who's been on the show and, and I have a feeling that you'll have a good answer for this is I'm curious what it is that you find that you are most obsessed with right now. And it can be anything. Um, you know, as far as like a just very random time suck, uh, <laughs> we just played a show in Macedonia with, um, an orchestra. It was like this live stream for our album release. And I've been getting really fascinated with Balkan history <laughs> and Turkish mm -hmm. history too, because we then spent some time there. Um, just knowing so little about it. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time on the YouTubes. Uh, so that's a, that's a random, <laughs> a random answer, <laughs> but that's something. Well, you know, it, it may seem like a leap to go from, you know, film to music or music to film back to music. And then eyewear. I'm, I'm curious if you have other business ventures in mind or, you know, what's, what's next for you and the band? Well, I mean, you know, the band is music is still the main uh, passion and focus, but um, you know, I just feel like there's so many ways to be creative and so many things I'm interested in. Um, you know, I think, uh, next for the band is, you know, making more music and figuring out some, uh, some new, new concepts and maybe some new ways to tour 
if, uh, you know, if things kind of continue the way they are, we're, we, we have some interesting, uh, I guess I, maybe I shouldn't mention this. I'm not sure how people feel about, uh, non-fungible token type stuff, but, you know, just kind of this, this time is a really interesting, uh, period where I feel like it's almost some similarities to what we were feeling during the virtual reality uh, heyday when there's just so much excitement and possibility in like the 2016 era. There's, there's a lot more technology that is happening now that seems to have similar kind of creative possibilities, um, just trying to figure out new ways to incorporate them uh, in the most responsible way possible. So yeah, just trying to stay creative and uh, figure out ways to uh, to incorporate that in 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 all things uh, in my life. Yeah, um, I'm curious if you have any go tos for when you hit a rough spot or you get stuck. Uh, not sure if you've struggled with with writer's block or any version oh, of yeah. that, but any anything that you kind of go to in that regard. Um, absolutely struggle with it. Uh, you know, every, every aspect of, of my life. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's equal parts. Um, I feel like I can't do a damn thing and everything feels like it's going wrong. Counteracted with, I feel like I can literally do anything. And it's, it's when it gets dark and it feels like, you know, there's, there uh, hit a wall or something. Um, just kind of a step back and be like, you know, uh, anything is possible. You can figure anything out, just breathe and, and work through it. Um, you know, if that's, that's meditation or, or whatever it might be, just calming down, trying to remove yourself. Uh, you know, if, if you can maybe, uh, uh, just look at a photo of the universe, remind yourself how small and in insignificant your problems are. And, uh, that sometimes puts it back in perspective. Yeah. Love that. Um, I'm curious if there's anything, um, you know, it, especially with creatives, I feel like once we get into a field, we start to see trends and other things that people are doing. And, and sometimes there are those things that like, because you're in that world, there are things that you see that just kind of drive you crazy. So I'm curious if either in, in the music world or, you know, eyewear or design in general, um, if there's anything that you see that kind of drives you nuts. Um, well, you know, within the eyewear world, it, it's kind of frustrating seeing, you know, like there's one major player that owns almost every major eyewear brand. Um, and people are paying exorbitant prices for one color sunglasses and then another pair of glasses. That's always frustrating. And then it's frustrating knowing that I'm such a small little tiny fish that, you know, that's trying to get the word out that there's a better way. Um, and on the music side of things, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely frustrating the lack of uh, physical connection that, that we were used to with our, with our fans um, changing slightly. Uh, that's, that's different, uh, but you know, getting better, yeah. getting better. And I love live music and I'm excited for that to, to be a thing again. <laughs> yeah. I know we've had, uh, yeah in the Indianapolis area, we've had some live outdoor shows that are starting to come back yeah. and curious to see how, how that will continue to evolve over the next, you know, few months and year or whatever. Right. So will I, I'm also as curious as you. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you'll be back to Indy at some point. Um, yes. So what do you think you would be doing if you weren't making music? Um, well, uh, I wasn't making music, probably film. If I wasn't making film, maybe uh, I would have started an eyewear business a long time ago, making crazy <laughs> interchangeable lens sunglasses. If I wasn't doing that, you know, maybe I would be 
pursuing my childhood dream of space exploration in some form or another. Yeah. I, I mean, as we're recording today, I think those, uh, the SpaceX tourists are up there right now. Right. So right, right, right. Kind of timestamps us a little bit, hopefully. Everything's, mm -hmm. I think everything took off well. <laughs> so now they just yeah. have to hang out there for a couple of days and come back. So, yeah. yeah. We, we now live in a world where you could go do that. It's true. <laughs> just got to write a big That's enough true. check, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, before we let you go, AJ, it's been really cool hearing about your eyewear brand, about AVU and and all about St. Motel. Um, I'm curious, before we go, if you have any asks or encouragements for our listeners. Well, I think, you know, it's uh, if you ever do find yourself in, in kind of hitting a wall or writer's block or whatever it is, <clears throat> or just a creative, creative you know, work is, is, is a very, um, sentimental beast. You get very attached to it. So I would say one kind of encouraging thing, don't worry. There's always time. And, you know, Genghis Khan didn't even start conquering the world until he was 40 and, uh, you can do anything. <laughs> I got it. I think that's the only time I've ever heard Genghis Khan used for a, a positive <laughs> <laughs> encouragement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, it, it's kind of playing off of your, your contrast of, you know, Saint and motel. It's the, it's the encouraging and the menacing. <laughs> yeah. He, he might've killed 11% of the world's population, but there's the, there's the other side. <laughs> well, Hey, before we let you go, tell our listeners where they can learn more about you, check out more about Saint motel and AVU. Um, well, I'm AJ Jackson or AJ Jackson jr. Uh, online and St. Motel is just at St. Motel and AVU is at AVU Eyewear on most uh, social channels. So, oh, and you know, AVU.com. So wherever, wherever you internet will be there. Um, maybe dumb question, but is your website the best place to, to purchase the glasses? Yeah, I think uh, the website's the best place to do it. I mean, you can do on a Facebook and Instagram too. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, AJ, thanks for being on the show today. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay, kids, that's episode 166 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.